one, Indiana's own Dana Black. How you guys doing today? Uh, we're here with Turn Left, and we are about to have an, a very interesting show. Um, I hope you are ready to talk about some policy, and I hope that you're ready to talk about um, what the Trump um, budget looks like. But give me just one second. I want to turn the speaker down. The boss told me to turn it down, and I forgot. So let me turn it down just a second. All right, that's better. That's better. How's everybody doing today? So last night I had a chance to go and visit um, Indiana Now meeting, um, Indi the Indianapolis chapter of National Organization of Women. Um, there was an amazing turnout. There was an amazing turnout. There was a cross-sectionality of women coming together, um, voicing their concerns about what's going on at the federal level and at the state level. Um, we we talked about a couple of bills that in Indiana now and Indianapolis now wants to um, attack and and uh, make sure our legislators know that we are involved. Um, but probably the best was uh, we actually sent uh, Donald Trump uh, some pink slips. I thought that was really cool. We, we took some uh, cards. I guess this is a, like a national movement where we were, you know, a part of a, a national movement to um, send, you know, number 45 um a list of concerns that we have that he should be aware of and so uh, i felt like that was a, a a great way for people to to let out some steam and they were able to uh uh just vent the way they needed to vent and i tell you what it was it was a good night i applaud the ladies over at indy now they are really doing some positive things um i will go ahead and put a plug in for them their next meeting will be june 14th now, I'm going to be honest with you. Normally, I don't actually remember dates, but that just happens to be my birthday. So I was able to remember that one. So if you, uh, they, their details will be coming soon. They'll make sure they, they let everyone know uh, what's going on and what the plans are, but they're planning a picnic maybe. Uh, but put it on your calendar, calendar. Indianapolis National Organization of Women. They'll have their next meeting on June 14th. Late, get involved. It was beautiful to see. It was a sea of every type of woman from Indianapolis. And, and um, they are passionate about a lot of things. Uh, one of the things that they are extremely passionate about was the bias bill that, that was voted down. And ironically, when that uh, bias bill was voted down, the Jewish community centers were receiving bomb threats. We had bomb threats over at the, uh, the Y, um, uh, the Avondale Meadows Y had a bomb threat. So, you know, the bias bill and, and the fact that Indiana is only one of five states that does not have a bias crime legislation in place, um, it speaks volumes. And so um, Mike Delph seems to be um, anti looking out for people. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, he seems to want to, uh, I don't know, he doesn't seem to understand the importance of having these bias crimes bill. And see, people want to get it confused and make it seem like it's only if you're a minority if you're targeted because you're a minority. No, if you're targeted because you're a white man and the person says, I'm targeting you because you're a white man, that's a hate crime. So, you know, it's it's a bias crime. It doesn't it's, it doesn't eliminate, you know, minority groups from, you know, obviously being charged the same way. So um, those ladies, like I said, over at Indian, Indianapolis now, they are really doing some positive things. Tonight, I really just have uh, two issues that I want to talk about. And because the reason why I only have two is because I really believe they affect us directly as citizens, both of the state of Indiana and our nation. Um, the first one, of course, is the, um, the, the road funding bill that the House passed, HB uh, 1002, 1002, that was introduced by Representative Soliday. Um, I want to talk about how that impacts our lives. And then the second one um, will be the proposed Trump budget. Now, that thing hasn't been approved yet, but I want to give you guys the impact of what that looks like if that thing's, thing comes out of Congress and, and, and some of the um, organizations that will be hurt. So um, first, I want to talk about um, the state of Indiana's infrastructure. If, if you had a chance to hear me out on the campaign trail, you know I talked diligently about how um, our infrastructure at, at the 2013 report stated that our Indiana infrastructure was rated a D across the board. I mean, uh, we were in really bad shape. We're still in, in bad shape. We 
um, have been neglecting um, taking care of business like we're supposed to. And so that conversation obviously swelled up and, and constituents were letting their representatives know that this thing is not good. The fact that we're driving on crappy roads and, and our waterways are in bad shape, our you know electrical grid is in bad shape, you guys need to do something about it. So Representative Holiday um, came up with a bill, but let me, I'm gonna read to you um, the re- what the report says for 2017 um, from the American Society of Civil Engineers or also known as the ASCE. And I took this straight from their website. So you can definitely go to www.infrastructurereport card.org and then type in Indiana and you can look at the report in detail but I want to read the synopsis to you just real quick Uh, while the nation's infrastructure earned a D plus in the 2017 infrastructure report card Indiana faces infrastructure challenges of its own for example driving on roads in need of repair in Indiana costs each driver two hundred and seventy two dollars per year and twenty point five percent of the bridges are rated structurally deficient. Drinking water needs in Indiana are estimated at $5.9 billion and wastewater needs total $7.16 billion. 240 dams are considered to be high hazard, high hazard potential. The state schools have an estimated capital expenditure gap of $518 million. Um, This deteriorating infrastructure impedes Indiana's ability to compete in an increasingly global marketplace. Success in the 21st century economy requires serious sustained leadership on infrastructure investment at all levels of government. Delaying these investments only escalates the cost and risk of aging infrastructure system and an option for for the country Indiana and families can no longer afford. So this, this synopsis comes straight from um, the American Society of Civil Engineers. These folks are supposed to know what they're talking about, and they've graded, you know, different areas of our infrastructure from uh, our airports, our roadways, our waterways, our electrical grids, schools, all of those things. And they they realize that Indiana is woefully behind. You've heard the dollars. You know, $272 per person just to drive on the roads is what it's costing you because of the lack of maintaining a proper infrastructure. So these things are very serious. So a, 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 a road funding plan is definitely necessary. It is definitely something that we need to, to really wrap our arms around. But the current bill, um, HB uh, 1002, uh, gosh, does not really, um, in my opinion, spread the cost out uh, among both uh, corporate America who utilizes our crossroads of America roads, you know, with transporting goods back and forth and the everyday average consumer, uh, you and I. So as you guys may know, um, the, the measure would raise fuel taxes by 10 uh, cents per gallon um, and adjust the rate up from one uh, up to one cent annually for inflation. So it'll if this bill passes, it'll start off with a 10 cent increase the first year when, when, when it goes into effect and then one cent after that. Um, and then of course they're gonna impose a new $15 vehicle registration fee um, for uh, vehicles that use you know the hybrid vehicles or electric cars who don't necessarily get gas. So they're raising, uh, they're increasing the tax on consumers, you and I. But also, you know, let's think about it. Commercial industries have to put gas um, in their vehicles too. So when food is being transported from Florida, because we all like oranges, right? We all like apples that are not, sometimes they're not grown right here in Indiana. They have to be transported across state lines and they have to get here. Well, guess what? There's gas that goes in those trucks. So that's a 10% increase in gas for that transportation. So anything that you purchase in a grocery store that travels over the highway they're going to have a 10 cent increase too. So guess what? Where is that increase that the commercial companies are going to recoup their money? They're going to recoup it from you. They're going to recoup it from the consumer. Trust, no, and believe they're not going to just eat that 10%. They're going to pass it down to you. So not only are you going to be receiving a 10 cent increase in, in what you put in your personal vehicle, there's going to be an increase in all produce, 
all food, anything that's manufactured that you have to go pick up somewhere, even shipping costs. Shipping costs are going to go up. So even if you order online, all of that stuff is going to be passed on to the consumer. Now, you're probably saying, well, I mean, this doesn't sound too bad. I mean, it's just a 10 cent increase. But he, here's the thing that that, that struck me um, when Senator Holliday, or Representative Holiday talked about introducing this plan. Um, one of the things he stated was uh, the door is always open for a bipartisan solution, but we refuse to kick the can down the road. Our plan is backed up by years of study producing data-driven, lasting solution to Indiana's infrastructure needs uh, that does not create debt for future generations. Well, See, the problem is, is that they neglected the roads to begin with, so we're the future. And so, therefore, yeah, you did create a deficit for the future because you didn't take care of things like you were supposed to. Well, what, well would the, did the Democrats offer anything? I mean, I hear, you know, the Republicans came up with some. Well, yes, they did. Of course, the Republican caucus in the House came up with a bill, and they offered alternatives to ta tax hikes. Now, he, now, Saladay just said he was looking for a bipartisan solution. But when the Dems offered their option to, uh, you know, how to fix our roads and infrastructure, they offered theirs on February 6th, it got nowhere. So I don't know if he was just saying it to be nice that he would listen to a bipartisan solution. I'll let you decide. But um, on February 6th, the Dems offered an alternative to this tax hike on working families by suggesting that the plan also halt previously enacted step down in the 6.25% corporate tax rate to 4.9. Okay, so think about this. Um, the goal was to get the corporate tax rate down from, from what it was in 2011 at 7% down to 4.9% by 2021. So if you cut taxes on corporations, that cuts out money that you will have for infrastructure. I mean, I, I'm not a, you know, economist, but some things make kind of blatant sense to me. Uh, I can look at that and say, wow, that's revenue lost. And the Democrats estimated that would be $65 million annually if we just repeal that step down, right? The step down tax decrease for corporations. See, to me, it seems like you ought to spread the cost around, right? They're not doing that. And, and, and Indiana's already pretty competitive when it comes to corporate taxes. I mean, if you look at our neighboring states, if you want to compare, Michigan has, has a corporate tax rate of 6%. Kentucky has a corporate rate tax of 6%. Tennessee and Missouri both have 6.5% tax rates. Um, Illinois, our neighbor to the west, they're at 7.75. And Wisconsin, they're at 7.9% tax rate. So we're already competitive at 6.5. We don't actually have to drop it down any lower to be competitive with other states in the in the region, in the in the Great Lakes area. We have enough. Um, Ohio does not actually have a corporate tax rate, uh, but um, they what they do have is, is gross receipts taxes with rates not uh, strictly comparable to the corporate income tax. I, I'm going be honest, I'm not really sure what that means, but I think what it means is that um, they tax on what their income is different. So they don't have just a, 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 a flat tax rate. It could be adjusted. So um, I, I don't live in Ohio. I really don't understand how that works. So anyway, um, so let's talk about this for just a second. I, I, we elected people um, in government to represent us and to look out for our interests. And they were supposed to take, you know, uh, the tax dollars that they collected. There's already a fuel tax as it is. But only, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 7% um, of that goes to roads and bridges of those taxes, or goes to infrastructure, and the rest of it gets put back in the general fund. Um, one of the things the Democrats suggested was taking all that gas tax that we collect already, putting it into um, fixing roads and bridges versus putting some of it in the general fund. I think we needed, you know, this thing has already passed out of the House. It's already gone through committee, it's passed out of the House, and it's in the Senate. And it looks like it's going to pass out of the Senate. I mean, at a 41 to 9 clip in the Senate, it doesn't appear like this one is going to, like, die, right? So listen to, listen to me carefully. 
Indiana, you are about to pay, the cost of living in Indiana is about to go up. The cost of living in Indiana is about to go up, but the same people who don't have an issue with raising the cost of living in Indiana have a major issue with raising the minimum wage. To me, it doesn't seem like they're looking out for the everyday Hoosier. It seems to me like, you know, they're really, really willing to take care of their buddy. It looks like they're really willing, you know, to take care of their corporate interests. I understand having a positive corporate climate. And I just read the numbers to you. We already had that. We were very competitive. But you want to raise the cost of living, but you're not also raising up the means for people to increase their income when it comes to minimum wage. I don't understand that. I don't understand how you are comfortable with saying that it is okay to increase taxes on the everyday average hardworking person, but continue, continue to cut corporate taxes. I don't know, I don't know how much we can do um, about this particular bill other than a lot of the senators and house representatives are gonna be up for re-election in 2018. The house of representatives, they're up every two years. House reps every two years. So in 2018, somebody in your district is up for re-election. If you're not liking the, we understand that we need an infrastructure bill. We get that. That is not misunderstanding. But the way they're going about it is they don't mind putting it on the backs of us and continuing to give corporate America their tax breaks. Also, I want to say half of the Senate is up in 2018. I know my senator, uh, Senator Jim Merritt, he's up for re-election and he's going to vote on this bill. Uh, I do hope somebody steps up. I might be out recruiting somebody myself uh, to run against Jim Merritt in my district, to give him a raise, to let him know that the things that you guys are doing in that state house have a negative impact, a negative impact on the citizens of the state. This, this, you know, it's already costing us $272 every time we drive. Now you want to increase the cost of, of how we get around. I just, I just don't understand why you couldn't, um, why our Republicans couldn't work more uh, with the Democrats to find a better solution that isn't putting the whole onus on us as working people. Something you guys ought to talk about with your elected officials. Um, don't let this thing slide because um, it is it's way too important. Um, so. Today, so I want to I want to jump into the federal conversation today because I want to spend a bulk of my time talking about Trump's budget. Um, this is not glamorous, exciting stuff, and I'm not you know uh, going to spend a lot of time you know commenting on uh, what different uh, media outlets are saying. What I did was I did some research. Um, I went to Washington Post. I went to uh, his website, so I could see the you know the proposal myself, um, so I can understand uh, what his budget looks like. Um, I wanted to research it so that I could share with you guys um, how impactful his ideas will have, and how impactful they are on us as as American citizens. This this thing is almost it's it's, it's a little scary. It's a little scary. Um, so on Thursday, the Trump administration released a preliminary, it's a preliminary, preliminary 2018 budget proposal, uh, which details many of the changes the president wants to make to federal government spending. Uh, the proposal only covers discretionary and not mandatory, mandatory spending. So what is the difference between uh, mandatory spending and discretionary spending? Well, mandatory spending um, is also what they call entitlement spending. Um, it goes to programs such as uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, which we like on the left. When we turn left, we like it. Not perfect, but we like it. Um, and, and also the interest on the national debt. So the mandatory spending is one thing, and then you have discretionary spending, um, uh, which must be, approved, must be approved by Congress. And it has to be approved every year for appropriation process. 
And discretionary spending, unlike mandatory spending, is, uh, can be subject to predetermined uh, limits each year. So what is, what is in discretionary spending? So discretionary spending has the defense budget, education, transportation, uh, Department of Veteran Affairs, and uh, organizations like the EPA, um, Department of Homeland Security, FDA, uh, and NASA, and those kind of organizations. So 45, um, wow, has suggested that we increase defense spending by 27%. I want that to settle in because, wow, 27% doesn't seem like a lot. But let me tell you what that really amounts to in dollars. $54 billion increase in defense spending. Now, I am all down for making sure America is safe. I am very comfortable with the idea that there are men and women across this country who volunteer their time to make sure that I have the right to get on this radio show and talk about how I feel about things on the left side of, of life, right? They are out there every day defending us. So I don't want anyone suggesting that I am not down with defending our country because that's not it. I'm be honest with you. When I was 18 years old, I thought about joining the military. And then I realized I'm not a military type girl. I, I couldn't succumb to that. So I am very appreciative of anyone who is willing to risk their lives to defend our nation and the ideals that we stand for. But an increase of 27% when we already, as a nation, spend more money on defense than the next seven countries combined? Oh, you're probably thinking, what are those countries? Uzbekistan? Jamaica? <laughs> no. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Let me read to you the list of countries combined who we spend more money than. China, they got over a billion people. Russia, we already know what their goals are to take over America. Saudi Arabia, France, United Kingdom, India, and Germany. We spend more money on defense than those seven countries Combined, people, combined. So I am inclined to believe that we already spend enough money on our defense. We have Pentagon spending, contractor spending, all that good stuff. I really honestly believe that we're at a point where we spend enough money. But he also wants to spend $2.6 billion on that wall that Mexico was paying for. I mean, I thought Mexico was paying for the wall. If Mexico was paying for the wall, why are we spending $2.6 billion? Oh, you believe that Mexico was going to pay for the wall and you voted for Trump because he was going to pay for the wall. Mm. And then the other thing that he wants to change is he wants to increase spending in the school choice program. All right, well, school choice is good, right? No, it's the voucher program. So they're gonna take money from, I'm gonna go through the agencies that are gonna get cut because he wants to increase, increase spending one place or three places, you know, the defense spending, the border wall of Mexico, the school voucher program, that's a lot of money. Where is he getting it from? That money's gotta come from somewhere. You can't just print more. <laughs> Right? So so where is the money coming from? Well, there's gonna be a cut to NASA by 1%. The Justice Department is gonna lose 4%. The Treasury Department is gonna lose 4%. Small Business Administration, they're gonna lose 5%. The Energy Department is gonna lose 6%. The Interior Department is gonna lose 12%. The Transportation Department, which we already learned from the, from the civil engineers, our infrastructure is rated D, they're going to lose 13%. The Department of Housing and Urban Development, 13%, because we already know that Trump you know, thinks that all black people live in the urban cities and in the inner city 
And he said he wants to look out for us. And he said that, you know, why not give me a chance? But he's cutting the Department of Housing and Urban Development by 13%. Now, I know it's not just people of color that live in urban areas. So don't don't come at me. I already know. And then he's also going to cut the Education Department by 14%. So he's going to increase the voucher program by $1.4 billion. But he's going to cut public education by 14%. The Commerce Department, it is being cut by 16%. Department of Health and Human Services is getting cut by 18%. Labor Department, 21%. Agricultural Department, uh, 21%. And the State Department, 29%. I know you're like, Dana, man, all these numbers, they it's not really entertaining. It's, it's not really fun stuff, but when you think about all these departments that are being cut, man, but the one that is is probably that sets me off a little bit and, and, and has me incredibly nervous about the direction of our country is the Environmental Protection Agency is going to be cut by 31%. 31%, the Environmental Protection Agency, you know, the people that make sure that you have clean water, sorry, Flint. People make sure you have clean air, sorry, Indiana, you're ranked 45th in the nation. The people that make sure that that everything that you consume is, is healthy for you. We're going to cut that by 31% because we need to increase our defense by 27% and pay for a wall that Mexico is supposed to pay for. Makes no sense to me. And I real and listen, I know that this is not exciting stuff, but I want you to under I want people to understand the impact of this bill if it goes through, if it of this budget, if it goes through. So <clears throat> what is the impact of these agencies getting cut? That means less services, right? But it also means that if people are going to be laid off and unemployed. Just in the EPA alone, the EPA alone. They can lose between three and five thousand employees. I thought I thought Trump was bringing jobs back. I thought, I thought I thought he said he wanted to bring jobs back to America. Well, here, he if if the EPA is getting cut by thirty one percent and three thousand to five thousand jobs could be cut. Mercy. What does that mean? But but. At least these agencies will actually continue to exist, right? These agencies will still be, you'll be able to pull up uh, uh, their website and go to their website and still um, get some type of services if you need it. There are 19 agencies that will not, that he's proposed that will not be have any funds at all. 19 agencies that have no funding at all. And I, again, I want to break this down. I want to go through each and every one of them because I, I don't think we really understand what, what it means when you say an agency is going to go bye-bye. Now, I, the argument is there are some agencies that are ineffective and just don't work. Mm, there may be some, some inefficiencies. I'm not going to tell you everything is efficient in government. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that. Um, things can definitely be improved. And maybe even some of these agencies we might not need. I'm not even going to argue that. Some of them. But I'm going to read each one of these agencies to you and what they do so that you have an understanding of um, the impact that they will have on our society. <clears throat> so 19 agencies will be cut. Um, the African Development Foundation. This, this foundation is an independent U.S. Uh, US government agency established by Congress to support and invest in African-owned and led enterprises which improve lives and livelihoods in poor and vulnerable African communities. Well, why is that why, why is that a bad thing? Well, China's already set up shop in Africa and many nations in Africa. They already have a foothold in Africa. They already are exploiting the natural resources from that continent. They're cutting that out. That's gone. Bye-bye. No investment there. The Appalachian Region, Regional Commission. The Appalachian Regional Commission is a regional economic development agency that represents a partnership of federal, state, and local governments. 
Established by an act of Congress in 1965, ARC is composed of, of, of governors in 13 Appalachian states. So um, what this agency does is, is work with economic opportunities. Um, they, they get workforce ready, uh, critical infrastructure needs, natural and cultural assets, leadership and community capacity. Now, nah, we don't need that in West Virginia where their economy is stalled. We don't need any of that. Nope, cut that out. That's gone. Mind you, if I'm not mistaken, quite a few of those 13 states in the Appalachian areas voted for 45. Yeah, I hope you weren't looking for any assistance in uh, ready workforce development because you're not getting that one. Uh, the Chemical Safety Board, it's going bye-bye. You know what that is? That is the independent federal agency charged with investigating industrial chemical accidents. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, let me say that again. If you're in an accident on the job and it's chemical related and, the, and you want some kind of uh, restitution for something that happened to you while you were at work, you're not getting that. You're not getting that help. Um, that's going bye-bye going bye-bye. The Corporation for National and Community Service. It's a federal agency that helps millions of Americans improve the lives of their fellow citizens through service, which include AmeriCorps, Senior Corps, Social uh, and Innovation Fund, and Volunteer Generation Fund. This was a, a Clinton program, so you know they was trying to get rid of that one. It was established in the Clinton years as a means to, you know, facilitate, you know, uh, community and help each other through volunteerism. Yeah. That's gone. Here's a big one. Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Let me see, what is that? What is that? Corporation for Public Broadcasting is an American private nonprofit corporation created by an act of the United States Congress and funded by the United States federal government to promote and help support public broadcasting. You know, things like PBS. And NPR, they're not getting funded anymore. Yeah, they're going bye-bye. PBS, yes, Kim, they're going bye-bye. <laughs> PBS, can, can you imagine no Sesame Street? <laughs> no Sesame Street. I'm going to start out the sun, y'all. Uh, Sesame Street, no more Sesame Street. Gone, bye-bye. <laughs> uh, well, except for the donations that, that, that people generously give to those organizations. But bye-bye, Big Bird, yes. Bye-bye. Cookie Monster, gone. Ham, you know, all of that. Count Dracula, gone. See ya. How many, how many times have we heard how early childhood development um, is helped by PBS programming? And how many times do we enjoy listening to NPR so that we can listen to things that aren't, you know, a bunch of lies from Breitbart? Bye-bye. Uh, another agency, the Delta Regional Authority. The Delta Regional Authority works to improve regional economic opportunity by helping to create jobs, build communities, and improve the lives of 10 million people who reside in the 252 counties and parishes of the eight uh, state Delta regions. So you know when they talk about the Delta, they're talking about the Mississippi Delta, right? So well, what are those states? Let's look at them. Alabama, Arkansas, Illinois, but this is the southern tip of you, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, Tennessee, gone bye-bye. Economic development, gone bye-bye. Listen, Alabama, Arkansas, Mississippi, Tennessee, you, you guys already have poor economies. We already know Mississippi is, is desperate for any type of help they can get. Bobby Jindal did a fantastic job in Louisiana, did he not? No. But all the funding to help that region, gone bye-bye. Uh, the Denali Commission.